In this video, we're going to look again one more time at frequency distributions, but this time talk about how to draw a visualization or a graphic. I've got other example videos that show how to do this in great detail, but let's just talk about the larger picture here. There's a couple of different graphs that are very typically used in the social sciences. We can use a bar chart, a histogram, or a polygon. I would say the bar graph or bar chart and histogram are most widely used for a single variable, for a univariate frequency distribution. There is a subtle difference between bar charts and histograms. Basically the difference is whether the bars are pushed together and touch or whether there's a gap between them. If there's a gap between them, that implies that the underlying variable is a discrete, non-orderable measure. If the bars are kind of pushed together so they touch and run into each other, that's called a histogram, and that's used for orderable, either discrete, orderable, or continuous data that have been grouped and put into uh, intervals and then graphed. Let's go ahead and take a look at uh, distribution. Here I've used the General Social Survey in year 2000 to show a frequency distribution of the percentage of people living in the nine different regions in the United States. Now, I know because I produced this in Stata, which is my favorite statistical application, that the variable shows the values of New England to Pacific because the underlying values from left to right are New England equals 1, Mid-Atlantic equals 2, East-North-Central equals 3, and so forth, up to the Pacific equaling 9. That is to say, the underlying numerical values are 1 through 9, and the attached labels are New England through the Pacific. So by default, this is the graph that uh, Stata produced for me. Maybe I'd like this graph organized differently. Because the data, this region variable, is non-orderable and discrete, I can put the bars in any order that I want. For example, here I've reversed the order of the bars. And this may make more sense because it's roughly equivalent to looking at a map of the United States going from the west coast to the east coast, from the Pacific to New England. And therefore, it kind of corresponds to a built-in view we have of the United States when we look at a north-up version of a North American map. On the other hand, I could organize these graphs any way I want because, as a non-orderable discrete variable, the order of the bars is irrelevant. Here I've created the same graphic to highlight where we have the most populated states and most populated regions. We can see that the so South Atlantic, followed by East, North, Central, by the Mid-Atlantic, and so forth, are our most populated areas, down to um, the New England area, which has the smallest number of people in it. Of course, I could have ordered the bars from low to high if my emphasis in my presentation was on the uh, relative small areas versus the large areas. Again, the general point to take away from this is that there's one bar for each category. The bar is raised or extruded up to the percentage of objects in that category. So we have approximately 18% of our sample in the South Atlantic and approximately 17% of our sample in the East, North, Central, and so forth. And the bars are separated or have a gap, again, giving the impression or alerting your reader that these are discrete, non-orderable measures. Well, here's another variable from the general social survey. It's an interesting variable because it kind of falls in between being a continuous variable or quantitative variable and a discrete orderable. The variable is how frequently is called sex freak, S-E-X-F-R-E-Q, and the question was asked to GSS respondents about how often did you have sex during the last 12 months. Possible responses, the underlying values go from 0 to 6, and the attached labels, as you can see, are 0 is not at all, 1 is once or twice, 2 is about once a month, all the way down to category 6, which is more than three times a week. I've shown you this, the frequency histogram, sorry, the frequency distribution for this down in the lower left. So you can see that in uh, the year of the, that I collected these data for, 22.48% of the sample responded not at all, all the way to 6.71% responding four plus times per week. Now, we can graph the, this distribution, and the way we do this is I'm going to treat these as if this is a continuous variable. So I'm going to push the bars together. I'm going to center the bar at the midpoint of each interval, and then the width of the bar will go from the lower true limit to the upper true limit. So technically, if we take a look at the category not at all, 
and the category adjacent to it, the once or twice, those two bars technically overlap. And you can even see in the graphic that the line looks a little thicker there. It's a little bit of a discrepancy because of the, the quality of my monitor and my computer. But those bars overlap because the upper true limit of the not at all category is the same value as the lower true limit as the once or twice category. And that's the hallmark of the continuous uh, distribution, continuous variables when we collapse them into a distribution and therefore we push the, par the, the bars together so that they touch and then this in distinction or compared to a bar chart would be called a histogram or a frequency histogram. Some people would even call this a relative frequency histogram because instead of giving you the raw counts in each interval or each category, I'm giving you percentages. Here's the distribution of age. And we're gonna, I'm going to use this to demonstrate a frequency polygon. So on the upper left is this distribution of age, which I think is not a very good example um, of, of a graphic. There's basically 72 bars there, ranging, there's one bar for 18-year-olds, one for 19, 20, 21, and so forth, up to the 89-year-olds. And I don't like this graphic because it's a little too busy. There's too much up and down. So realistically, I would collapse this like I've done in the lower right. But on the other hand, this is the most accurate or most precise rendition of the data. Sometimes we could average out some of those ups and downs by superimposing a line over it, as I've done on, on the upper right. What I've done is I've produced the same bar chart and then something called a kernel density plot laid over it. And the kernel density plot takes little pieces of the data, kind of a smaller group of ages, and calculates some kind of distribution and then it moves the the window of the ages a little bit to the older ages but they still overlap and it keeps kind of calculating little bits and pieces so think of it as an average it's kind of averaging out the highs and lows and the peaks and valleys put together this is a much better uh, representation of the data simply because I can now focus on the general shape of the distribution and ignore kind of the individual valleys and peaks Another very popular kind of representation of the data is a, is a frequency polygon. And that's I'm showing in the lower left. Basically, it takes uh, almost that, it takes the bars and kind of converts them to an area. Now, I'm going to use the distribution on the lower right to show you how that works. So here I have my grouped frequency distribution. If I were to draw a line from the midpoint of every one of those intervals to the next midpoint and connect them, that's my frequency polygon. Of course, I wouldn't show both the frequency polygon and the frequency histogram at the same time. I would do one or the other. They represent the same thing visually. And part of the reason why, if we, if we look at this a little bit, here you can see an area that I'm going to draw in that's part of the polygon, but not part of the histogram. Now up here, a little bit higher, we have part of the frequency histogram that's not part of the polygon. So you can see that there are gaps. We've got pieces of, the, of one graph that are not part of the other. It turns out that if we could measure or calculate the area of all the pieces of the histogram that are not part of the polygon, and all the pieces of the polygon that are not part of the histogram, and we would add those numbers up, they would net out to zero. So that the area under the histogram is equal to the area under the polygon. And in that regard, these are absolutely equal representations of the data, and you should feel free to use either one. Realistically, the one you use will be dependent upon the, the norms of whatever area of research you're working in. I think in the social sciences, most people are going to use a histogram, and in the hard sciences, you're maybe more likely to see a frequency polygon. But either way, it's the same visual representation of the data, and either one of them is very appropriate. Here's the last uh, chart I'm going to show you. And I'm going to call this one, it's a bar chart, but I'm going to call it an average bar chart. What I've done here is I've taken these bars. The length of each bar represents an average. And I've broken my sample down into men and women, and within men and women, down by their religious beliefs, whether they have a, um, whether the religious intensity is strong, somewhat strong, not very strong, or whether they have no religious intensity. The bar represents average sexual frequency per year. So now you can see we can directly compare means for men and women among people who have no religious intensity. We see a couple of different patterns going on here. 
First of all, regardless of religious intensity, men report having sex more on average than women. Number two, we can see that as religious intensity decreases, the average sexual frequency generally increases for both men and for women. Now this is not a histogram and neither is it a bar chart. It's a average bar chart where instead of pulling this out to a percentage or a count, we've extruded the bar or pulled the bar out to an arithmetic average. And yet it provides a very nice way to make very focused comparisons, in this case comparing directly comparing men and women by their religious intensity. Well, there you go. That's about it on frequencies, uh, frequency distributions, and uh, visualizations of them. I encourage you to go over to the example section of our YouTube channel and look at uh, hand drawings of how to create these and how to use different kinds of software packages um, to create these kinds of histograms and bar charts so that you can put these uh, into your own work. As usual, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me and I'll do my best to answer them.